Kia ora. Uh, this is my first time in New Zealand, and I've never been to a conference like this. It's been absolutely beautiful. All right, and I often, I don't often give PowerPoint presentations, so let's hope this is really flawless. Yay, okay. So hordes of angry women wrote to me after the publication of this book. They weren't angry at me. The book is the accumulation of eight years' research about the trauma, internalized misogyny, mental health issues that often lie behind women's problematic substance use, and also internalized racism and intergenerational trauma sometimes. So my social media inboxes became a kind of safe harbor for readers to dock their most rageful thoughts. If I'm honest, uh, sometimes, especially during the media cycle of the book, where I was relentlessly asked about the four pages relating to my own childhood trauma, this became a bit exhausting sometimes. Women would write to me saying, maintain the rage. And I think, <laughs> I've been maintaining it for so long. Um, but these messages all had one thing in common, I noticed, and that was that the owners had felt catastrophically disempowered, often around ownership of their bodies. I'm just going to put this down. I'm not actually going to bang on about my war story, because we all know that rock bottom to redemption narrative. You know, it's basically harks back to ancient mythologies and the hero's journey, except with drugs instead of monsters, you know. Um, but just very briefly, I started drinking heavily at 13. I was a poly drug user, but mainly favoring speed. Um, I took residence on some really ugly sofas, but I can see I'm reading The Guardian, so that's good. Um, and I sank to the bottom of a lot of drug using communities, mainly through my tendency to get to know people through sleeping with them, which apparently isn't cool. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I digress. My book, Women of Substances, is what some people have called an addiction memoir, but more accurately, it's a big picture of, of women and substance use with myself as the case study. I did honestly ask myself, do we really need another white middle-class woman talking about her addiction story? I weighed this up for quite a long time. There were other options. The, there were the options of interviewing multiple people, multiple case studies. Um, I felt there are quite a few books like that out there, and I wanted one kind of coherent narrative. And I didn't feel comfortable ethically with the idea of choosing someone else to be the subject of a book, um, which would be quite a hairy book. And I know quite a few journalists who've done that, and then it's ended badly. So I thought, okay, well, if I use myself as the case study, it would just be a jumping off point. So I then interviewed lots of <clears throat> lots of indigenous researchers, I've talked about the trans experience, I've talked about the sex worker experience. So really I'm just kind of using my back catalogue to stitch it all together. I was interested in answering the most pressing questions of my addictive behaviour, I reckon most people can relate to. Um, why do I keep doing the same thing over and over again? Why do I say yes to everything? even when I used to write no on my hand before I left the house in the evening? Why am I so impulsive and so self-destructive? Why, um, why have I so intertwined drugs with my childhood story? And yet, why do I keep further traumatizing myself as an adult through being unsafe? I have to say, when I started it, I didn't realize that addiction and treatment were gendered issues. I was simply using myself as the case study, and I'm female, so it was just from the perspective of being a woman. But day by day, my view became more politicized. And so apologies to the men in the room, because we are gonna go into secret women's business. Um, and it, you know, it's very much all about the female perspective. But that's not to say I'm saying women have, have it worse, it's just that I was focusing on the female perspective. How do you start writing a research-heavy book when so far your journalism has mainly been um, about culture and music? Like this. 
I literally started Googling words like self-medication professor or dopamine addiction, as well as scouring places like the conversation for experts. But once I'd got the first few interviewees under my belt, they then recommended other people and so on. And I soon felt that I was putting together this bigger picture of women and substance use, which they might not individually see, apart from you know maybe once a year and they come to a conference like this and they hear other people talk. But if you think you've ever felt imposter syndrome, imagine going along to an academic who's an expert in their field and admitting that you are the case study. You know, I didn't literally go to them. I used to do that all the time, but it was still a bit awkward. I wound up interviewing 35 clinicians, neuroscientists, people working on the front line about dual diagnosis, eating disorders, sexual assault, childhood trauma, domestic violence, self-harm and more. So here are some of the things I learned. Something I kept hearing a lot is that women self-medicate more than men. But then I started to ask if that's really true. Sometimes I think we're not self-medicating, we're just taking care of business. Certainly the more feminist academics that I interviewed though said, yes, women do self-medicate more than men because we live in a patriarchy with all the additional stresses and that entails before you even get to things like sexual trauma and domestic violence. But then perhaps men frame self-medication differently. It's framed as a culturally acceptable after work drink or getting wasted with the guys because it's far less socially acceptable for men to admit that they're struggling to a GP or otherwise. So women self-report more. And this is how gender bias really gets in the way. What I do think is that women tend to get pathologized a lot more than men. So when it comes to drug use, men can be bad, but women have to be mad or sad. To put it more technically, women are considered to be more likely to use drugs and alcohol for negative reinforcement, such as alleviating anxiety. Whereas men, their reasons are supposed to tend towards positive reinforcement, such as letting off steam. I think because of those social perceptions, women have learned to frame their own substance use as meaning there's something wrong with us up here. Partly because there's more stigma around women's drug use, but also because we're conditioned to think that dissatisfaction with our lives means we're unwell. And these adverts show how that kind of attitude begins. Check this one out. In the middle of the last century, there are loads of adverts for pharmaceutical speed sedatives in magazines. So this, this advert, advert's from 1967, and it says, you can't free her, but you can help her feel less anxious. So in other words, <laughs> she's got to keep doing the housework, but you can sedate her. <laughs> there are so many ads like this. There's a 1956 advert for Surface Hill which offers to raise the emotional threshold against everyday stresses. And there's a photograph of a woman hemmed in by a vacuum cleaner and a screaming kid. And then there's the foreground of a 1970 advert for Ritalin, which was the slide before. Actually, is it? Yeah, right, there we go. Um, helps relieve chronic fatigue and apathy quickly. It promises. Of course, women can experience serious mental health issues that they will often self-medicate, but these adverts were more accurately advising men on how to keep their unfulfilled wives working efficiently. <laughs> and I think we've sort of internalized that, because now that baton has been seized by the wine o'clock meme makers. Here's a wine o'clock meme. You would have seen tons of these, I'm sure. And you know, look, there's nothing wrong with a bit of humor except the punctuation, um, but, it's <laughs> but it's weird. It's like we think we're not allowed to just enjoy a glass of wine. You know, it has to be framed um, like there's something wrong. And it's because stigma and enjoyment are not natural bedfellows. Um, let's talk about stigma. 
It affects everyone, it affects men and women. But for women whose experiences of addiction infiltrate their family life, whether through domestic violence or impacting on the care of children, the story becomes far more complicated. Stigma deters a mother from seeking help until things are truly dire for her and her children. It skews the way she's viewed by her family, maybe by a partner, maybe even by the AOD service that she comes into contact with. The frustrating thing is stigma makes no sense in Australia because it's a country that's had a national drug policy of harm minimization since 1985. But stigma is generated daily by, by the dominant media and the dominant media does not buy into harm minimization one little bit. When women make tabloid headlines for serious drug incidents, I, I reckon there's three key tropes that they fall into. The first one is the party girl, and this will be when somebody overdoses on a pill, or dies probably on a pill at a festival, um, and it would be a, a blonde white girl fetishized on, on the front page. And somebody will come forward and vouch it was the first time she'd ever taken a pill in her life. Uh, and it's, it's this kind of, this could be your child, blonde angel trope. Um, the second is the fallen middle classer, often, you know, a politician's daughter. A tall poppy to be scythed. And there's, there's a bit of, um, you know, sneering and, and, and laughing at this. And it's been a hit with readers ever since those pulp fiction novels where nice girls would get corrupted by jazz fiends. Um, but it's the final trope I've identified, the slovenly mother who is the dumping ground for disgust. And, and this is really dangerous. One example amongst scores of tabloid stories that were published during the writing of my book concerned the triple murder of Adeline Yvette Rigney Wilson and her kids. This was a headline that wasn't just Women's Weekly, this was a headline in um, newspapers as well, lots of newspapers that were syndicated. Murdered South Australian kids went hungry as slain mother put ice habit, habit ahead of family. The more appropriate headline would have been man murders woman and children. <laughs> and this isn't a secondary headline like, oh, we found this out later. This is the headline everyone went with straight off the bat. Very little has been reported on about Stephen Peach, the partner who murdered Yvette. She calls herself Yvette. Um, Yvette was an Aboriginal woman, which means that she was 34 to 80 times more likely to experience violence than a non-Indigenous Australian. And there's a writer in Australia called Celeste Little, and she keeps a blog called Dead Aboriginal Women. And it keeps a, a tally of, of each year's victims of assault and domestic violence. So she's painfully aware of the sort of stigmatizing headlines that accompany each story. She says, it seems that there's a whole new level of victim blame and demonization at play when sexism intersects with racism in this country. In fact, one of the only news stories that moved past Yvette's methamphetamine use was um, published in a newspaper called The Advertiser. And the journalist talked to the many carers who'd looked after her through her troubled childhood and gave the context of Yvette's life and, and you know, all the things that she'd experienced. And we learned that she was one of nine siblings. She was shunted around the country as a child. She was frequently around adult drug use. She had a large scar on her scalp and she suffered an ear infection so serious she had to be flown to hospital. It was widely accepted by those who'd met her that she had experienced terrible abuse and neglect. None of this was mentioned in the other stories. With the huge demand for, for beds and treatment facilities for women, but particularly women with children, Yvette would have waited six months, maybe, for a place to come up to treat her ice addiction. Uh, instead, to save herself, she would more likely have to lose her children to the care system to have them shunted from pillar to post the way that she once was. And so this is just one example of, of how stigma affects women. Um, one carer of Yvette said she hoped at the very least that Yvette's death will change practices for women who's been through what she's been through. Um, this is a slide from the film Animal Kingdom, 
it's about uh, a Melbourne gangland family, and in this scene, uh, I guess the, the the head of the family is about to coerce a woman into taking smack. Um, and there's a chapter in Women of Substances, which is about older men and younger women. There's often a power imbalance between men and women who use drugs. And anecdotally, AOD workers will have heard awful stories about women being coerced into drug use. Oddly, though, I could find very few studies to back that up. I don't know why. It's, it's just not something that's been covered very much, sometimes within injecting communities. But what I did find were studies acknowledging that women were act often active initiates. And that was quite interesting. I had, to re I had to adjust my way of thinking a bit. It was one by Dr. Joanne Bryan and Professor Carla Trelaw from the University of New South Wales. And they collected data from 334 people who inject drugs. And they said, while it's true that there are times when, when women feel pressured to inject drugs, there's also evidence that the people who, who give the injections can feel pressured into giving them. Some women described how their male part partner's drug use was part of the attraction. Sometimes it was the prestige of being with a dealer. Sometimes it was protection from you know, other people in the community. Uh, other young women were using drugs to bolster their idea of equality. You know, like, this is, I'm, I'm, being, I'm acting the same as men. And when I thought about it, much of that was my experience too. To young Jenny, older men were brokers. They had the drugs, I didn't have to pay for them. The thing is, there's still that power imbalance. And it's one that's encountered through sheer naivety, and it's, it's a situation that can go downhill fast. One clinician I interviewed who works with young people in Brisbane said a client might say to him, well, actually, I'm exploiting them because I get all these drugs for free. And he's like, yeah, but you're having sex with them. And they say, yeah, but that doesn't cost me anything. And he says, yeah, but if we were to put a price on the sex that you're performing, the same as we do for drugs, what's the going rate for oral sex from a 16-year-old girl? I actually nicked the chapter title from this clinician because I love the way he described the scenario. He calls it a crude form of seduction. Uh, this is a, a scene from Betty Blue, um, a film which armchair uh, psychiatrists tend to diagnose the characters having borderline personality disorder on the internet. We have very gendered views of mental illness and addiction, and those stereotypes are often archaic. The Diagnostic Statistical Manual, I'm going to say, is gender biased. Back in 1983, there was an article in American Psychologist pointing out that the experts on the DSM task force, the people who decide on the categories of mental disorders, etc., were mostly men who had codified their biased assumptions about what behaviours were healthy in a woman and what were not. So that was 1983. Skip forward to 2018. I thought, I wonder if that's still the case. So I had a look at the current task force um, behind the latest um, edition of the DSM. There's 27 members, four are women, and incidentally, I can't quite tell from looking at the pictures how many are non-Caucasian, but it's about as low. What are unhealthy behaviours in a woman? Well, having a suite of mechani coping mechanisms to cope with trauma, apparently. Because those coping mechanisms have been labelled borderline personality disorder. And that's a diagnosis for difficult women and often gay men. I, I just dumped the problem being that if you diagnose someone with borderline personality disorder, a suite of symptoms um, coping for coping with trauma, then you're probably just going to medicate them and not deal with the underlying trauma. Behind the scenes, it's actually often called hard life syndrome, to give you an idea. Then there are those disorders that are traditionally thought to be very male, like ADHD and autism. So women tend to fall between the cracks and not be diagnosed at all. 
or they might get diagnosed as their sons are diagnosed and the penny drops. It's unsurprising they get missed because women present differently. So take ADHD. When we think of ADHD, we're transported back to the disruptive boy in the classroom, you know, um, interrupting the lessons. But it affects girls too. It's just that they tend to display the more attention deficit symptoms, which is harder to diagnose. Girls are easily dismissed as hair twirling daydreamers, particularly in the 1980s when I was growing up, when, to be frank, there wasn't much expected of girls at all. Journalist Gina Pira, author of Is It You, Me, or Adult ADD, which is what the Americans call ADHD, tells me as they grow older, girls might try and mask their disorganization by adopting a non-conformist persona, smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, and having sex earlier than their peers. It's not uncommon for Gina to hear from women who've self-medicated with cocaine and methamphetamine. They report that it gives them a clear head for the first time in their life, she says, and confidence. After a lifetime of feeling tentative and likely to screw up at any moment, confidence can be a welcome feeling. And take autism. Women are conditioned to be so social, and not only that, but to be the glue of our families. We're the ones organizing the get-togethers, making sure nobody's feeling left out and buying the nibbles. So it follows that women who don't naturally understand social etiquette can really work hard to mask that to avoid being ostracized. And that's, there's one thing that makes that job easier, and that's drugs and alcohol. These things can become social lube, allowing us to feel more at ease until it becomes a crutch that we can't do without. On to the hormones. <laughs> I did warn you. Um, some newspaper in the UK leaped onto this part of the book, actually, and came up with a headline, Women's menstrual cycles are linked to alcohol, says recovering alcoholic Jenny Valentish. So that was great. But it is true. A woman's menstrual cycle causes fluctuations in her renal, cardiovascular, hematological, and immune systems. So it makes sense that these hormonal fluctuations have a knock-on effect on the way that her body processes alcohol. In the book, I break that down week by week, but the edited highlights are that higher levels of estrogen, which you get in some weeks, makes you both crave substances more and makes you more sensitive to them. Progesterone is more like the fun police. Once you get a, a wave of progesterone, your interest wanes. It's highly unlikely that a woman in the throes of addiction is going to notice these changes in her body from week to week. I, I certainly didn't. But what I do think is really important to get across if you work in the treatment sector is that there's likely to be massive hormonal upheaval if a woman quits substances abruptly. I couldn't find anything about this for the layperson. It was all, it was all deeply buried in, in research papers that were really hard to to, you know, break down. It's where AA came in really handy. Because women there talk anecdotally, and I heard from so many women who basically noticed eventually that they were busting or, you know, relapsing at the same time every month. And that information isn't anywhere else. Although I do think it should be on the scrolls when you walk in, you know, you, you've got the scrolls of the AA meeting. It should be there, it, honestly. It's very important. <laughs> um, Lastly, a few of my interviewees, one a psychiatrist and then a couple who were clinicians, they've observed that women in perimenopause, so that's the period before menopause and it can last about 10 years, um, are very vulnerable to old traumas resurfacing. Now, I don't exactly know why that is, maybe it's like the hormones realigning, but basically things like childhood traumas can, uh, at this point in your life, re-emerge. So again, it's, it's something that is really useful to know if you work within the sector. This is actually an image I found from a Tumblr called Show Us Your Story. Uh, it's worth a look. It's, it's people, you know, that you can see that they have this, um, 
initial layout, and then they, they mark on it things like where they've self-harmed, the blue is childhood memory, so you can see that's the sexual parts of the body in this case. Uh, I guess it's just yet another way of sharing stories. But a woman from a young age is sent the message that her body is a commodity. For some, it's more through cultural cues, so, you know, through Instagram and media. Um, for others, it's more literal. Her body, from a young age, is used by relatives and friends of the family for their own sexual gain. And so a woman who's full of rage might stage a silent rebellion through her body. At one end of the scale, she chops her hair off when she has a breakup. At the other end, she puts her foot to the accelerator and drives her body into the ground. Parents, newspapers, police might, you know, warn her of the dangers of getting paralytic. But at least when she raises that bottle to her lips or inhales on a pipe, it's her executive decision. I would argue that there's a, cre a key triumvirate of self-destructive behaviors or maladaptive coping mechanisms as they're more diplomatically known. And I think these are actually a woman's way of reclaiming her body. As well as problematic substance use, there's eating disorders and there's self-harm. The three can rotate. It's a bit like they pop up like you're playing whack-a-mole. So bang, another one pops up, bang, another one pops up. Or they can coexist at the same time. Through their physicality, they offer relief from intrusive circular thoughts, but they're also imbued with violence. Drinking feels like drowning yourself. Taking drugs feels like obliteration. Self-harm takes the focus of pain from emotional to a precise point on the body. Throwing up is the literal purging of shame. These behaviors are often in part down to the exploration of self-loathing, but I also think that any act of aggression against the body is, a, is an act of regaining ownership of it. Just as when a person inflicts harm on another person, they are taking ownership of that other person's body. To decide to harm oneself, or to put on a lot of weight, as Hine Birangi said yesterday, or to lose a lot of weight, can be particularly appealing to an adolescent with no autonomy or to a person who has experienced sexual abuse or to someone who has been shamed for their sexuality or to anyone who feels that their body is being co-opted by everyone else. You'll all know that it's eating disorders that have the most complex relationship with substance use. Research from Columbia University has found that 3% of the general population have eating disorders. Now, when you look at the population who have problematic substance use, that, that goes from 3% to 35%. And combined with substance use, it can be a really deadly situation, but it's, it's one of the sector's biggest problems, I would say. Because usually a detox or a rehab isn't going to admit someone who's got a, a serious eating disorder that needs medical supervision. I mean, they can't. They don't have that expertise. And an eating disorder ward isn't going to admit someone who's intoxicated or withdrawing. So these people fall between the cracks, and, and they'll often die. Uh, and it's a crisis we desperately need resources to meet. And yet, as Sir Mason Jury said yesterday, our services are not properly connected. They're certainly not in Australia. They're not in the UK. They're not, they're not here. Okay, moving on to trauma. There was a period in my early 20s when I was going to my GP every single week. I've got my medical records. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, I'm complaining of tingling. I'm complaining of loss of sensation. I'm complaining of nausea. Um, I'm, I'm complaining of panic. And also admitting to heavy amphetamine use. But whenever there was one of those lightning fast assessments uh, of 10 questions or something, I'd be honest that I'd mentioned rape and I'd mentioned childhood sexual abuse, yet I kept getting sent away, having been shown how to blow in and out of a paper bag, and then I'd be back again next week. Even if you do get a referral somewhere, services are very good at carving up the pie, saying, well, this is a drug problem, 
This is a mental health problem. This is a housing problem. This is a relationship problem. And so off the client goes, in theory, to access all these multitude services. And trauma gets overlooked a lot. But there's also you know, the aspect of if someone's low functioning, they're not going to be able to access all these services. They're not going to be able to follow up with all the different phone calls and, and make those appointments. But it is, it is strange that trauma is the elephant in the room because the majority of women and men who access a drug and alcohol service are going to have a history of trauma. One of the people I interviewed about it um, is Prof Professor Jayashri Kolkani, who's the director of the Monash Alfred's Psychiatry Research Center. I'd really highly recommend looking her up because she just blew my mind, the things she came out with. So her name was Jayashri Kolkani. She says, it's almost as though the trauma side of it has been put in a box and someone is dealing with it. We did a survey of whether clinicians working in mental health took a history of trauma in the females admitted to the service. More than half did not. Someone once said to me, well, the social workers are dealing with that. She puts on a puzzled voice. The social workers are saying, what? We do at least know a lot more about the relationship between trauma and substance use now. There have been some incredible books and studies, and you know, I, I, think, I think that's trickled down to the general population and the media even. Um, there's Dr. Gabor Mate in, in the States. He goes as far as to say basically everyone he sees has a trauma background. There's Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score. Um, and, and does lots of talking around the world about that. He has a trauma center in the States. And there's Stephanie Covington, who in the 80s and 90s carried out the key um, studies about women and trauma and substance use. Uh, she's 72 now, but she's still active in, on the talking circuit. And th those kind of towering statistics she found, she found that the studies on addicted women, 74% reported sexual abuse, 52% reported physical abuse, and 72% re reported emotional abuse. Those statistics have been backed up in countless studies since. But because blundering in as an AOD worker and trying to tackle someone's trauma could have adverse outcomes, not to mention possibly be triggering for the individual counselor, um, it's often just left. Now, it's understandable, but there does need to at least be training about what trauma is. So, you know, how does it act? What, what to look out for, what not to do. And I don't know what the score is in New Zealand on that front, but in Australia, there's Phoenix Australia, which offers trauma-informed training to drug and alcohol services. Otherwise, you might have the situation that my mate had when she went to a rehab and she had a one-to-one -one counseling session and she talked about her rape experience. And then the counselor told her, well, you've got to share that with a mixed group or, or leave, because that's what we do here. I mean, trauma-informed care would at least mean being informed enough to know not to do that. Oh, I've jumped ahead, but I'll leave Vicky there. And that leaves me to, should there be more women-only treatment? I think so. Many women I've spoken to disagree. Um, they feel like they really benefited from mixed groups and from hearing stories from men. Um, I felt women's groups for me were less complicated. I didn't have to worry about my hair, <laughs> tension, sexual tension. It was just so much simpler. But at the more serious end of the spectrum, a woman might be in the process of leaving an abusive relationship or focusing on getting her kids back, or she might generally feel unsafe in mixed groups. Um, so this is Vicky Roach on the screen. Um, the irony of Vicky Roach being an advocate for Aboriginal women in the criminal justice system, which she is, is that until she, went, she first went to an adult prison at 17, she thought she was Italian. So you guessed it, she was fostered into a, a white Christian family uh, in a western suburb of Sydney, and she told me, they let me believe I was a wog. So 
I was interviewing her about intergenerational trauma, you know, pain, grief, and loss, and displacement that has been passed down because of colonization. In fact, she's a, a Ewan woman born to a stolen generation's mother. First Nations people are 16 times more likely to be incarcerated in Australia. And Vicky's life followed the script of someone who's experienced intergenerational trauma. So she was a runaway at nine. She was a heroin user by 14 with a habit supported by sex work in King's Cross. And between 1976 and 2003, she had 125 convictions or findings of guilt. But in 2004, she went to jail for the final time. While interned, she attained a master's and she got politicized. And with the help of the Human Rights Law Research Center, she successfully overturned the Howard government's ban on prisoners voting at elections, which she kind of, she now disagrees with. She's thinking, I don't think we should vote at all. But that wasn't what I'm, that's not what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> she was talking to me about how the prison system should be abolished, or at the very least, cultural, cultural sensitive training should be across the board for anyone working in the criminal justice system. But she also talked about ways of healing. The most promising alternative she's come across is Dajiri, which translates as deep listening. It's a central desert tradition of going out in the bush and reconnecting with country and culture. There's, there's a book about it I'd really recommend by uh, Judy Atkinson, and it's called Trauma Trails recreating the song lines, the transgressional effects of trauma in indigenous Australia. Just as modern psychology is, is talking a lot right now about the gut, the gut-brain connection, Judy believes we have a brain-feet connection and that feet are involved in storytelling. So she brings context to trauma by walking across country with people, mapping their stories as they talk, taking in the sites of massacres, settlements, and displacement that wreaks havoc on the lives of that person's family. And then those trails give greater meaning to uncontrollable feelings. And Dajiri is complementary to narrative therapy. Um, I, I might be preaching to the converted here because it was created by um, a New Zealand therapist, David Epstein, and also an Australian social worker, Michael White in the early 80s, and then it was further developed in Adelaide with Aboriginal community workers. And narrative thera therapy challenges a language of deficit. So somebody might say, I'm a terrible mother. By looking into the individual's life in the context of enormous social upheaval, and by building on themes of resilience and achievement, narrative ther therapy lifts more positive narratives to the fore. So instead of I'm a terrible mother, it could be I'm a survivor despite all the odds against me. Vicky also talked about the importance of services that don't come across like services. If you're an Aboriginal woman seeking treatment, you've got a greater chance of having your kids taken away from you and you've got the histor historical context of having kids taken away. So in Australia, there's the Sisters Day Out program which was created by JIRA, which was formerly the Aboriginal Family Violence Prevention and Legal Service. And that tours the states, including jails, which is where Vicky encountered it. And it's basically a pamper day. And actually, it reminds me of uh, perhaps Tala Tala Noa in, in, in the way that it's, you know, more conversation, natural conversation. And it's a chance for women while they're being treated to manicures, hairstyling, Reiki, to engage with support services. But the, you know, it's not support services where you're sat in a booth with pamphlets. You'll be sitting alongside people getting their nails done, having a conversation. So it's a supportive, nurturing environment. And as Vicky pointed out to me, self-care has become a white privileged concept. And she cracked up laughing when I asked her about it. She was like, self-care for me is staying out of my boyfriend's reach. Another way women differ to men when it comes to substance use is we're more prone to serious conditions, yay, such as high blood pressure, cirrhosis of the liver, 
nerve damage, which is alcoholic polyneuropathy, weakening of the heart muscle and damage to the brain, and in a much shorter time frame than it can happen to men. Alcohol also raises estrogen levels, so uh, higher estrogen levels can worsen symptoms of polycystic ovary syndrome and fibroids and endometriosis, and it can also increase the risk of breast cancer. In 2009, the Journal of National Cancer Institute, the National Cancer Institute published the findings of researchers that for every 10 grams of alcohol consumed per day, which is one standard drink, there is an 11% increase in the risk of developing breast cancer. I'm not sure how helpful that information would be to clients accessing a service. Probably on the list of priorities quite low, but it's just some of the findings of the book. Short-term or even one-off drug use is also riskier for females. Um, in 1995, two teenage girls in two different hemispheres died of water intoxication uh, after taking ecstasy. Um, so water intoxication and hyp hyponatremia, which is low sodium in the blood. That was Leah Betts in the UK um, and Anna Woods in Australia. And when it happened to Leah Betts, there were, there were billboards everywhere. It was at an age where I was just starting to get into ecstasy and it was very off-putting. Um, billboards of Leah in a hospital bed, tubes everywhere. Um, so, so both of them had drunk litres of water, possibly because drug agencies at the time were warning of the dangers of being dehydrated. So people were kind of overcompensating and drinking a lot of water. Um, but this overhydration diluted the levels of sodium in their blood, which caused convulsing and coma and death. High-profile publicity campaigns from the parents of both girls warned other consumers of the risks of both ecstasy and now of overhydrating. But what's not commonly known is that females are way more at risk. A study from the Netherlands looked at the high incidence of mild hypertremia in females using ecstasy. They went to a rave party in 2010 in Amsterdam called Awakenings. And um, there are 63 subjects, male and female, were identified as having taken MDMA. And then their plasma sodium concentration was tested. And the researchers found that only 3% of the males developed hyponatremia, as opposed to 25% of the females. It's not just down to the fact that women were taking more care to stay hydrating, hydrated. MDMA increases plasma copeptin in females, but not males. And so females report more thirst and the sensation of a dry mouth after taking a drug. While I was writing this book, um, three academics that I interviewed raised concerns about gender bias in drug and alcohol research. There was Professor Jan Copeland, um, the director of the National Cannabis Prevention and Information Center. She began her career in the 90s researching and publishing um, groundbreaking papers about the quality of treatment for women uh, in both single sex and mixed sex services. And she says she was told by a leading drug and alcohol physician back then that it was a complete waste of time to address anything to do with women because men are the majority and that's where the focus should be. I kept hearing that. Jay Nasher, the professor of uh, women's, the women's health psychology at the University of Western Sydney, she said as a junior researcher, I was advised by my head of department not to do women's health research and definitely not to do anything remotely feminist because it would completely ruin my career. He told me I should do basic experimental research. He didn't say on men, but that seemed to be the implication. And not much has changed. Another academic who asked to remain anonymous said, gender isn't a big priority on the, on the agenda. It's just like everything else. It's a patriarchal society, and that's how the research world operates too. It's also how the treatment world tends to operate. Because there, men are still seen to be the norm. And it is true that more men access treatment than women. But it's because women have more barriers to treatment because you know, mainly of childcare, also of stigma. So they're, they're more, more generally left in the population. Um, but the problem there is that um, many, many uh, treatment services don't gender split their data. So 
any data you get from treatment centers tends to be about the male experience, and that perpetuates this thing of continuing to provide services geared around the male experience. So it was nothing short of a bombshell when in October 2016, there was this report from the National Drug and Alcohol Research Center in Australia, and it concluded that by the end of the last century, men and women's drinking, it was actually about equal. And not only that, but there is some evidence that women born after 1981, they're now drinking more than men. That was based on pooling data from 68 studies about drinking habits across 36 countries. So it, it was huge. But in any case, even if men were the majority when it comes to drug and alcohol research, we can't just go with the majority rule. And to illustrate this, I'll get to the point of the rat. Um, <laughs> this is how um, male-based research can physically backfire on women. Uh, there's a Melbourne neuroscientist, Rachel Hill, and she discovered that out of the 710 scientific studies she reviewed for her paper on schizophrenia, 75 to 80% exclusively use male rats. And she immediately recognized the irony there by rejecting female rodents on the grounds that the many stages of the reproductive cycle would you know, contaminate the data. Scientists are ignoring an inconvenient truth. If these fluctuating hormone levels or possible pregnancy of a female rat are gonna, are gonna mess up a, pharmaco a pharmaco ooh, pharmacology trial, then the drug being trialed cannot be relied on to have the intended effect on human females. That's something that the, uh, the manufacturer of Sleep Aid Ambien was forced to confront when women kept overdosing on the recommended dose. And of course, it also applies to drug replacement and maintenance medications. I mentioned Professor J. Ashri Kolkani earlier, and she's adamant that male data can't be extrapolated into the female population. She says, all you need to do is monitor the cycle. Yes, it's another variable, but there are statistical ways to do that. You recruit larger numbers and so on. It's not an insurmountable problem. But people, are, people use it to say, let's not bother. And then there's Professor Wayne Hall, uh, who's the director of the Center of Youth Substance Abuse Research at the University of Queensland, and he agrees. He says, the lack of gender-specific research is an ongoing problem. The low-hanging fruit for research is to exclude women from trials. And as a consequence, we know very little about the effects of drugs on women. Another obstacle faced by research is, is that their project's likely to build on existing studies. And if those existing studies were done on men, then you have to continue using those. I'm gonna wind up by saying, um, I'm gonna wind up by talking about my personal commitment. Um, you know, I've written the book, the book's done, I don't work in the sector, but I do, I have joined this organization called AOD Media Watch, which is people just volunteering. Um, there's a core group of people, and they're uh, clinicians, ex-law enforcement um, researchers. And what we do is we look out for stories in the media, like that one I mentioned earlier about a vet. We look out for stories that are salacious, stigmatizing, um, and then we, or inaccurate, like when people rush to identify uh, a substance that people have overdosed on, but they get it wrong. So we then write a response, we peer review our response, usually it's a bit scathing, um, and then we ask the journalist who wrote the original piece if they want to reply. They, you know, they, we give them the right of reply, we give them 48 hours. And uh, then we publish it and, and we put it all over social media. Um, one of the recent ones I did was about uh, a, a really beautiful Aboriginal girl who um, held up a subway store dressed in a burqa, and she's not Muslim. So you can imagine how the media loved it. You can imagine the sort of headlines that ran. So we just look for the stories that are really salacious and sort of, you know, the, the work that we're trying to do, just taking it back and making it so much harder. I'm about to wrap up, is that okay, time-wise? Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>